Good evening. Uh, thank you for such a nice uh, introduction. Indeed, uh, it's a good uh, moment uh, to go today, perhaps even to um, talk about these issues. Uh, Poland is celebrating uh, two important anniversaries this year. Um, it's the uh, 15th anniversary of, of accession to the European Union, but also the 30th anniversary of the beginning of the, the great transformation that began in Central Eastern Europe um, in 1989. So there is um, a lot to think about, not only to celebrate, um, because uh, as um, some of you may know, um, Poland, Polish society, the Polish society is among the most the Euro enthusiastic societies um, in the EU. Um, at the same time, uh, um, there is a lot of uh, issues between between uh, the Polish government um, and uh, the European institutions now. Um, and one can talk about the democratic backsliding and uh, problems with rule of law and other and European values. So one can ask why. Uh, why um, this is such a Euro-enthusiastic society and yet problems um, with uh, perhaps maintaining this uh, original commitment or maybe not. So let us, let us uh, talk about it um, a little bit. Um, before I say anything else, I'd like to say that it's very difficult um, to speak of the Polish society as a whole, because um, it is really, I mean, like every other society, is, is, is of course um, uh, internally very um, diverse, and there are many different boundaries that cut across the society, but in, the, in recent years um, it became uh, more divided than ever before, and one of the issues over which um, it is divided also um, concerns um, Europe and the EU and European membership. Um, maybe uh, by the way of uh, I mean introduction and to begin with, I would uh, I would um, show uh, this um, slide with uh, what I call the four European narratives, and this is not just a Polish perspective. I believe that um, we can. Uh, Actually, apply this this um, for um, different uh, concepts, for different approaches, not only to Poland, not only to the region of Central Eastern Europe, but in a, in a way to to Europe as a whole. Um, so, what are the four European narratives? Uh, one is it, to put it very uh, very simply. Um, the first one says that the EU is good for what it is. In other words, we are in favor of the EU, we support the EU, we want to be members of the EU because the EU represents values that we identify with, with values which are important for us, um, and, and uh, we believe that uh, the EU um, uh, represents uh, the, um, the kind of uh, organization um, of societies um, uh, that that should be integrated on the basis of those values. So EU is good for what it is. Uh, the second narrative mm, uh, is a bit different and I would say this is the most commonly, uh, the, more, the most generally represented, the most common um, uh, approach to the EU Certainly in Poland, and since I'm when I'm talking about the Polish perspective, let me let me say so. Um, the EU is good because it's good for us. In other words, it's an instrumental value. We want to be in the EU because what EU gives us, in a broad sense, not just necessarily and the financial and, and and resources and security, but it is an instrumental value. It is it is good. We are, we, we we like it. We want to be part of it because of what it gives us. Uh, the third narrative, much less was much less uh, positive, is the EU. Uh, we have doubts about the EU. We have problems with the EU, but nevertheless, we want to be in it because it's a lesser evil. Any alternative would be much worse. So. Um, in the Polish um, context, um, uh, this, of course, um, uh, first of all, 
um, uh, draws our attention to relations with Russia. As a big uh, brother to the East, as a big country that Poland um, knows as, uh, as a, well, at times as, as, as an oppressor, um, but also uh, a potential, um, um, potentially dangerous uh, neighbor, and, and therefore it's better to be in the EU, it's better to be in NATO, it's better to integrate in Western structures, because any alternative would be much, much worse. So even if we have a lot to say against the European institutions, against European values, against a lot that um, we associate the EU with, still we want to be there uh, because, because anything else would be much, much um, worse and, and, and indeed dangerous. And then there's also the fourth, um, uh, um, the fourth uh, narrative, uh, which is against it, which is, which, is, which is, I would say, not only Eurosceptic, but Euroreject. This is, um, the EU is evil and should be rejected. Of course, this is not a, a very common approach, but it does exist, as many represented among those who um, if, um, take um, a very radical, uh, fundamentalist um, uh, approach, and say, well, for, for example, um, they, for them, um, the EU uh, represents um, the secular, um, society represents uh, uh, represents a non-religious society, uh, sometimes even um, called a, 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 a the culture the culture of death, um, which is the the concept uh, used by those people, by those uh, um, participants in public discussion who would uh, raise the issue that. And there is uh, the EU is, is, is liberal in, in the sense of morality that uh, destroys the family that uh, that supports um, same-sex marriages, uh, euthanasia, abortion, and all those things. So this is this kind of narrative. So people who stand by these values, and of course some of them at least say, but we, we should not. We should actually withdraw from the European Union, even if there would be there will be a price to, to pay. Now, let us, uh, um, let us move to, to some, something a little bit different um, now. Um, uh, look at this, the Polish um, uh, relation with the EU from a different perspective. Uh, it's a question of identity. Um, it's not only from the Polish um, uh, point of view, I would say. Um, in a way, one can argue that to construct a common European identity as such, um, to build European integration, was in a way easier when the Iron Curtain was still uh, where it was, still existed. Why? Because identity is always constructed vis-a-vis -vis some others, some significant others. And no matter how different the founding members of the EU and, and later other members of the of European communities at that time, no matter how different they, they were, they have a lot in common um, in relation or in contrast to the other Europe, the alternative Europe. So they were all, there was market economy, there was democracy, there was human rights, there were, um, there were liberal values, democracy, uh, to the west of the Iron Curtain and to the east there was a dictatorial uh, communist system which of course um, in a way uh, was symmetrically opposite to the values um, which I just mentioned. So it was easy to say we in the European community we represent a certain way of life, certain system of values and this can be a basis, a strong and solid basis of our collective identity, because, and this is, this is easy to, to, to think about us as a community, because on the other side of this very tangible and very real the boundary which I don't, the Iron Carter was, there was another Europe, there was a symmetrically opposite Europe. Now, after the fall of the Iron Curtain, that was not so easy anymore. And it is not so easy anymore to speak about the collective European identity, especially because, first of all, we are not sure, and it's not so easy to say, what do we all have in common now with, in the enlarged 
uh, expanding and therefore I would say more diluted Europe and even more important we are not sure where do we want the new border of the, the future EU to be. Who is going to be on the other side? To whom we are going to say you're different. You may be good neighbors but you're not us. Where? Who, who is going to be left behind this new border and what kind of border do we want to, to have? And this is a very important issue. We are, we are not sure. We in Europe, not in Poland, not in the region of Central Eastern Europe, but in Europe, in Europe as such. We don't know yet. We, don't have, we have not found the answer to, 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 to this question. We don't know where to put the border, how far the potential further enlargement could, could go, who may theoretically potentially be invited to join and where and, and, and where the boundary is going to be, who is going to be uh, left on the other side of it. This is, of course, a very serious issue from the point of view of collective identity. What do we have in common and on which principles, on which values, on which uh, um, laws or, 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 or principles um, we, we, we are going to build our our collective identity and our and our future future society. Um, one more remark that would apply not just to Poland but also to Poland, um, but to um, European societies in general. Um, we all humans must live in what I call ontological. Or say it called mental, if you like, security. We want to live in the world which we understand. If radical change happens because of migration, if we emigrate because of others coming to our country, because of radical changes of the political system, of the economic system, if there is some radical, quick change around us, we may, some of us, kind of um, uh, cope with it easier, others don't, we feel that our ontological security is, is disturbed. We lose it. A loss of security is a very negative sensation, it's a very dangerous process. Uh, how do we react to this? Some of us may react, I would say, constructively by trying to rebuild our life and our identity and our activities so that we meet a new, um, a new environment, we, we cope with the new uh, challenges, we adjust to the new, to the changing environment. Others have problems with this, um, for whatever reasons, because they are not, don't have enough education, because they have not enough strength, because they are too old, because for whatever reasons they don't feel fit to positively respond to the changes. What do they do? What do they do then? How, what, what can be a, an escape from this um, uh, ontological insecurity? Well, um, one option is to choose a strong leader. A strong leader can be seen as a remedy for this. We trust the leader, we rely on, the, on, on their leadership, and we follow the leader. And then we are free from making, having to make difficult choices. Choice and freedom can be a burden, as we all know. We, we learned about it from Mary Fromm's book many years ago. Freedom may be a burden. Then we escape from it. Um, because freedom is connected to responsibility. And we may not like to, uh, to, to take this responsibility for our own life. So a strong leader who, sh who, who guides us, who shows us the way, releases us of this responsibility. And this may be one way to, 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 um, to somehow cope with these problems of insecurity. Another, perhaps, uh, uh, solution is going back to tradition. Tradition gives us simple answers to difficult questions, explains everything which we no longer understand, tells us who is the enemy and who is a friend, what is good, what is evil, who, who, who is to be responsible for everything that we are unhappy about. Uh, tradition, well, I mentioned here neo-traditionalism, uh, a move 
behind uh, a secure boundaries of tradition. It may take a form of religious fundamentalism, for example, nationalism, uh, or any other uh, any other secure boundary that helps us to feel safe um, uh, and protected from the world to which we don't understand, and helps us to find uh, answers to all those questions that we don't really know how to answer. I think that this ontological security was was disturbed both in the West and in the East of former um, divided Europe of former um, Iron Curtain. Um, in the West, perhaps because Europe became too large, too enlarged, too big, and uh, I may say with all other reasons that we may mention in this context, this is at least partial reason why uh, the European Constitutional Treaty was rejected by the French and the um, uh, Dutch societies in the referendum. They refused to delegate more power to European institutions in, because they didn't want all those new Europeans to have um, uh, influence on the future of Europe. Not because they, are re they were rejected in a general sense, but because they were unknown, they were not familiar. We didn't know what to do with them. How, how, who are all those people, those hundreds of millions or tens of millions of strange people who all, this, all of a sudden became members of, of our community? Um, perhaps this, um, uh, um, this insecurity is also um, uh, one of the reasons why, uh, why Brexit, why referendum Brexit. We know that, that the Polish migration to the European Union was certainly one of the important factors uh, responsible for uh, the, uh, the, the outcome of, uh, of um, uh, the referendum. Um, in Britain, in the, in the East, um, this loss of security was even stronger because their societies became open all of a sudden. In the economic sense, in the sense of mobility, uh, there was a possibility of all those strangers coming to their country, but also ideas, new ideas, previously unknown, especially for institutions and for groups of people who were very traditional in their view of the world, or who were afraid of ideological, moral, or, uh, or um, uh, well, political also, philosophical also, competition from the outside. Uh, the Roman Catholic Church in the Polish case was one of those. Um, they, they were afraid that there would be all those liberal ideas of laicite and secularity would become uh, popular in the Polish society. So they felt insecure in their position in society, in the Roman society, so um, they reacted um, defensively. Polish, the Polish perspective is perhaps um, uh, special because it is historically determined, like most national perspectives, of course, are, and uh, because Poland um, had its history of, of um, being um, occupied and oppressed by the neighboring countries and then didn't exist as a, as, a, as, a, so, as a state for a long time. Um, a lot of uh, a lot of views and concepts developed because on the basis of this historical experience. Just to mention a few points here, um, Poles are afraid of otherness in general. Why? Because um, the community, the national community, has been constructed and was constructed, especially in the 19th century, as a community of culture. There was no Polish citizenship, there was no Polish state. Us were people were Polish speaking Roman Catholics. People of different culture were others. Others did not belong. And then it's also the legacy of communism that added to it. Communism um, created not only ideologically, but also in reality, 
a society which was almost completely homogenous in terms of culture, ethnicity, language, religion. So otherness is something with which the majority of Poles have no or very little experience. There is very little of culturally learned patterns to deal with otherness, any, any otherness, not just, not just ethnic. So, and, and others are, uh, uh, they are perceived as a source of danger. The otherness is dangerous. Uh, the legacy of the partitions and also of the, um, uh, the tragedies of the 20th century was also a self-perception of Poles as victims of foreign oppression. That's how Poles see themselves. Victims of oppression. Poles always look around in, in Europe as well, uh, thinking of where would the attack come from? Where would the aggression come from? Who is going to be the next, um, the, the next source of danger? Uh, whom do we all have to be afraid of? Traditionally, of course, there was a historically, la, la, in the largely mythologized history, but that's the way it is in, in, in human uh, memory. The, the Germans and the Russians, the two big nations on two sides of the Polish borders, um, but also you know, but, but, but any, any, foreign, um, any foreign presence in, in the Polish society is seen as, as a potential source of danger. At the, it's very typical that at the beginning, very characteristic, at the beginning of the Polish membership in the EU, it was clear that the Polish uh, representatives, the political representatives in European institutions were mainly interested in having this ability to block decisions. They were less interested in how to make their own ideas accepted by others. The main concern was how to protect ourselves in case someone wants to do something that would be against us. So there is this, it is the, 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 the result of this perception mm, and this, uh, this idea of victim, victim this, the whole concept of victimization, of course, it, I don't have the time to develop on it, but it also shows in, in culture, it shows in, in ritual, it shows in politics. It is said that Poles um, are very good in celebrating tragedies and defeats. We are not so good in celebrating victories. We don't know how to do it, what, but we do know very well how to celebrate anniversaries of national tragedy. Because this, this fits very well with, with, with our self-perception, with our historically uh, constructed um, identity. Um, it is, of course, um, because the national community uh, is seen as a culturally homogenous, uh, it, it based on values, uh, it, is, it is difficult to construct collective identity above and beyond national borders. This is perhaps why, even if Poles do like to be in the European Union and appreciate the membership in the European Union, there is very little of collective European identity in Poland, feeling that we belong, that Europe is us. Europe is, the European Union is typically perceived, in the, also in, in, in the mass media, by the way, as an external entity, external body that we may like or dislike, but it is external, it's them, not us, still after 15 after 15 years. And of course, national sovereignty as a supreme value, sovereignty understood in a very traditional way as independence, not as an ability to look after your business in the, alone or with others, as there should be, I believe, the case in, 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 in such uh, organizations like European Union, but individually as a nation. National sovereignty remains a supreme value against which nobody really dares to, to speak or nobody really wants to speak. And um, as I said at the, at the beginning, there is a lot of um, problems that the current uh, government has with European institutions, the European Commission, the European Parliament also. Um, the, as you know, there are procedures against uh, the European, uh, the Polish government on the basis of uh, not really um, uh, meeting the requirements of European law and, and uh, especially the, uh, not, not really uh, accepting the principles of rule of law in the way it is normally uh, understood in the European Union. Um, what are the, the reasons for that? Well, first, I've already mentioned is the fact that EU is, a, is seen as a foreign, as a foreign entity. Um, 
I said that the overwhelming majority of the Polish society wants to be in the EU. And that's undoubtedly true, it's over 80%. Um, that's probably one of the highest um, in, um, in the EU. But unfortunately, especially outside the big urban centers, it is mainly or almost exclusively about money. Europe is perceived as a provider of funds which we deserve. We deserve funds because we are victims of foreign oppression, because we were isolated, and now the funds that are coming, we deserve. But we deserve it unconditionally. The research which my team um, did um, in small, uh, several small communities in Poland show very, shows very clearly that uh, this money, this considerable sums of money that come to the country are seen as something which we deserve, but this is our property, we should do with it what we want, and we do not want anybody, anybody, to tell us what to do with it. In other words, we do not accept this money as collective European investment in common European future, but as a donation to Poland, which Poland can use as, as we want, and we don't accept anybody to, 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 to mention any conditions of it. Like, you should do this money, this, but not that, because of what Europe wants. Um, this is very logical, because it, is, it follows from those um, uh, legacies of the past and, and, and the way Poland sees itself in the international mm, frame. Um, if, uh, the problem with otherness, the fear of otherness in recent years, uh, manifested itself in a panic related to the potential uh, uh, invasion, it was called, of refugees. Refugees who are mainly presented as cultural others, therefore dangerous. And not only because those refugees from Syria were said to be all terrorists, uh, but by the by the government by the governmental media, but they were culturally different because of being Muslims, because of allegedly having different values. So they were seen as a danger, and the EU, because of accepting uh, refugees, especially Germany, um, because of accepting refugees, um, it was was criticized for being irresponsible, for being suicidal, and, as the former Polish Prime Minister once said in the Parliament, as insane. That's a very important concept here. The EU is insane, which means it is not evil necessarily, but it's, it's sick, it's insane, and we cannot therefore be expected to follow what they say. So if, if the EU institutions say Poland and other countries should accept at least a small number of refugees, they say no, because it's suicidal, it's destructive. We don't want to commit suicide as a culture, as a civilization. Our civilization is based on, based on Christian values, and we don't want all those <coughs> others, because they will rape our women, and they will convert us all to, uh, into, to Islam, and they will destroy our civilization. Those who want it may be evil, of course, but if not evil, there might be something wrong with them. Apparently, they are insane. Therefore, Central Eastern Europe should think of itself, of itself as a, the only true depository of real European values. The Central Eastern Europe should create an alternative integration in the form of Visegrad countries, in the form of the, the 3C uh, concept that a Polish president uh, mentioned so often, uh, going more east, uh, uniting with um, other countries of the region, outside the region, those countries which are democratic, but which are not liberal. Because the liberal values are not for us, they say. We should be democratic, but democracy is then understood um, as uh, the majority, the support of the majority. That, uh, nothing else. And, and uh, all those checks and balances and other uh, components of liberal democracy um, are not mentioned in any positive way. As long as you have, if you have power, as long as your power is supported by the majority, it's, 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 all, it's all democratic, and of course, uh, this means that uh, Poland would like to um, unite with the Hungarian government, with the, perhaps 
also other, although they are not they are not so frequently mentioned by name, but one doesn't have to have too much imagination to think what what, what are other illiberal democracies um, that may um, they may 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 join. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>